Based on the historical data, we are always improving and refining our acquisition process. So we have an internal algorithm, which consists of 15 major important parameters of what we look at when we buy a park. So that is always changing and that is always evolving. If you're in the real estate business right now, you have heard people talk about and probably experienced yourself issues finding the next deal. Acquisitions have pulled back and it's harder and harder to find those deals, it seems like at the moment. With interest rates, hiking, inflation, all these things that are happening, it's difficult. It's always difficult, right? But but you, we're, we are working consistently to improve that process. All of us are uh, to find that next deal. Our guest today has an acquisition algorithm that she's going to share with you and some things how they are finding deals and how they've improved this over time as well to find better deals. And I, I think there's some key things here for you to be able to apply to your business in finding better deals especially over a period of time, as you continually to do this, build relationships and improve your, your process. You're going to hear some things that she's going to lay out that's going to be very helpful. She also has a, a blue ocean strategy that I think you should think about as well, especially if you're getting into the business or you're trying to pursue growth. Man, you have to think about your product or your place in the market almost where, where there's little to no competition. That can help. That helps so many people to move very fast. Our guest today... Charlotte Dunford, she's done, done just that. Her and her team, man, they're moving quickly because of their Blue Ocean strategy, because of their acquisition algorithm. All right, she's a managing partner at Johns Creek Capital LLC, a private equity syndication firm that focuses on small mobile home park investments. Charlotte and the team led the company to serve 23 investors with subscriptions ranging from 10,000 to over 2.7 million each. Currently, Johns Creek Capital sponsors 26 parks over 4.8 million in subscriptions. They've not grown, I mean, done 26 parks on accident. They've had some strategy. They have been pushing to make this happen. And you're going to hear that in Charlotte's interview today. Charlotte, welcome to the show. You have some expertise that, and I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into because uh, that, and our strategy of how we start or operate a business, how we move forward, how we look at those things, so important. And you have become an expert in that, I feel like, in your field here and in your business. And then also the acquisitions component. Right now, everyone's struggling with acquisitions. I, th- I feel like, anyway, I hear it constantly. And so I'm looking forward to diving into how you all are, are handling the acquisitions. Uh, department, you know, or how you're finding deals ultimately, right? Charlotte, right. welcome again. And who are you? Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself so, so we can jump into your specialty. Right. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Charlotte Dunford. I am the managing partner at Johns Creek Capital. We Our niche focuses on smaller mobile home park syndications. Um, currently, we have a $4.8 million, over 4.8 investor subscriptions. And uh, we actually just closed our 26th park last week. Congratulations. Wow. Thank that's exciting. Uh, 26 parks. Uh, that, that doesn't happen by accident either. Right. Oh yeah. I, I yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, let's jump into your old strategy a little bit that, you know, the, you, you talk about this blue ocean strategy. I want to, uh, maybe you could help the listeners. And I don't really understand what that means to you. What, what does that mean? And then let's dive into what that is for you. Right. So blue ocean strategy really in, in a simplest terms, it would be to find a marketplace or to invent a product so that it creates a new marketplace where the competition is not so fierce. So when I started out, when I was 25 years old, I was taking a corporate job. And that's at the time already had some real estate deals using my salary, but that that was just nowhere near enough where I want what I wanted to achieve. So I wanted to go into multifamily at first because it was everybody knew about it and it was very heated and it, it sounded like a great idea. But I found myself in a difficult position at the beginning to get into multifamily because you know as 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 much as probably audience knows from listening to a lot of podcasts is that you know uh, the big boys of multifamily have been at it for decades uh, for me for but for a newbie like me at the time when I was 25 when I started out it wasn't an easy option to go into multifamily but I found mobile home parks to be a sector where it was a blue ocean and we could acquire 
parks at a, a higher cap rate at the time in 2019 was 10%, um, 8 to 10%. So that was very attractive. So that's where the blue ocean strategy started. And I'm a firm believer in the blue ocean strategy, meaning that if you fail a business, it's because you fail to ex- escape um, competition. If you fail at business, it's because you, you fail to escape the competition. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's right. Awesome. I, I quote it right out of my favorite book. It's called From Zero to One by Peter Thiel, one of the most successful investors of all time, really. I was, I was writing that down because I, I, that's, a, that's, a that's a good one. I, I loved <laughs> how you said, you know, it's like find the product that creates a new marketplace, either a new marketplace or at least a place where the competition is, isn't so fierce. Exactly. Either a new marketplace where no one has been to before, it's a, it's a brand new product, is so you're creating a new market, a new customer base, or in the given marketplace that's already existing, you have a product that's so unique that is in a niche where not everybody chasing after. That gives you a really good advantage on pricing and really gives you a niche. And that's where, mm-hmm. where you can make the profits off. Yeah. Have you seen other areas in your business where you've been able to apply this strategy other than say just like the overarching thought of we're going to focus on mobile home parks? Any other ways that you've seen this work? Right. So th- that's, you know, our, our niche is smaller mobile home parks. Instead of focusing on parks with 100 plus paths, we focus on kind of acquisition strategy of 50 and, and, and below. And with that, it's really a different animal. So you don't really have a per se, you know, on site property manager. It's really you're, you're trying to train a different animal. So you have to assemble the team locally differently. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, so you kind of like, You've niched and then you've like sub niched again, right? You know, right. You're niching down uh, to niche create, niche. Yeah. yeah, to create your own market. I, I think it's uh, brilliant, really. I, I think it's going to help. It helps you to, or I want to ask you. I shouldn't uh, assume, but how has this helped you to move faster potentially? You know, than maybe you would have otherwise. Right. Absolutely. That's a great question. So. Because we're smaller, uh, focusing on smaller parks doesn't mean that our company is, you know, growing it, you know, any any um, s- uh, slower. Because because we're small, we are able to move fast. That means that all of our deals are financed through either cash, because the amounts are small, the dollar amounts are small, so our investors are able to maybe four to five investors can put into a deal, and that's that. So the acquisition time frame become a lot shorter, and because we're smaller. We are also able to get more seller financing and very attractive terms too. One of the first deals we got, we got 25% down, 3% interest rate, and 30-year amortization. So those are very attractive terms. So because of those attractiveness, we're able to move very quickly. And since we started in 2020, we've already got our 26th park. So that's that's one of the one of the major benefits. Nice. So other benefits that maybe you probably didn't see all those benefits coming in the beginning, right? By niching down like this. Right. I think the journey of entrepreneurship, or if you're starting a business, you kind of start to you go on a path, you have a strategy, you follow that strategy, and you pivot a little bit and you improve and you see the benefits coming, you focus on what's working and you know, continue on that path. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. But what about how did it affect maybe the, your ability to raise funds? You know, as you're speaking, as, as your team, you know, I, know, I, I was just thinking about, I know you're more focused on acquisitions, but I was just thinking about, you know, niching down, being more focused. Did this help in, in, in any way with raising money or not? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I think because you don't want to be, that's what we say is that we don't have to be absolutely competing with everybody as far as raising funds. You just have to be unique unique in your own way and provide the best quality financial product for investors. So I think as far as, you know, when I start to have a conversation with an investor, it does help us differentiate ourselves in the market, uh, marketplace by being focusing on small to medium level home parks, because a lot of investors on board, they're, ta- they're saying, yeah, you know, you're buying things that a lot of people aren't buying. And those people from very huge institutional funds or big, you know, the big boys, they're not really focusing on. So that's a niche and niches are, are attractive. And the logic behind it, a, a lot of people find attractive as well. What about cons? Has this, do you feel like this has hindered your growth in any way, or maybe hurt the business in any other way by being so focused? Well, 
I think it's, it never hurts to be focused, but I think we do have to be careful with the features that come with small mobile home parks, right? So the features that come with them are, you know, you have to want to make sure you have enough reserves for each deal. You don't want to be undercapitalized at the end of the day. And, you know, because they're smaller, therefore their cash flow tends to be slightly less. And because of that, when there is an, an issue, Coming, let's say with the utility line, we all know that for mobile home parks, you know, there, there could be utility problems because you're own, owning the land, right? So you want to make sure you have enough reserves to cover that. If not, you, you don't want to run out of money. You don't want to want to be undercapitalized because a lot of times in a small park, the cash flow can be a little bit tight. So that's the, the one thing is to be pre- prepared for the, for the reserves. And because they're so small and there are the capital raise is, is smaller. So uh, having a larger reserve. That does not really hurt the overall return that much or at all. Awesome. What about, uh, are there any plans to changing the strategy or adding to? Absolutely. I think we, you know, for any company, you should always be pivoting your strategy as your company grows. And based on your historical data, it's just like machine learning. You're improving the software, you're improving the robot, whatever you call it. You're improving the machine based on the data you get. So based on the historical data, we are always improving and refining our acquisition process. So we have an internal algorithm, which consists of 15 major important parameters of what we look at when we buy a part. So that is always changing and that is always evolving. So the strategy changes with the market, changes with the landscape of mobile home parks because people are buying up more and more, you know, mom and pop parks and that does change things. And the rates are going up and inflation is happening. So all of that changes, um, but we are, we are always adjusting. Let's jump into the acquisition side a little bit and yeah. let's speak to you ha- or ha- how you're finding deals right now. I know you have an algorithm around that. I'd love to hear more about that and, and let's help the listeners to learn this as well. Right. Absolutely. So how we're sourcing our deals. So throughout our, when we started in 2019, we have been building lots of relationships with brokers, sellers, has buyers, uh, people in the industry to kind of send our deals automatically. And we also seek them out through all sorts of different channels, the traditional ones online, and also just broker relationships and emails and tracing down the sellers, past sellers. So all those channels to get our deals on our desk. And once we get them, we look at them, we put them through our kind of a proprietary internal algorithm that we've developed using data that we have gathered uh, throughout through de- doing deals and uh, knowing the 15 major parameters that's important that are important to qualify a deal. Uh, one of the top ones is the ratio between mobile park owned homes versus tenant owned homes. So the more tenant owned homes you have in the park, the higher score this parameter would have. So it essentially is we assign a weight to different each parameter. So this parameter is very heavy weighted. We'll, we'll probably give it a, you know, we'll, we'll, I think this one is at a five. So you give it a score and it produces another score. And at the end of the day, you kind of average out the total score to give it a pass or fail score. That's how we qualify our deals and mark it up. Of course, that's important as well. And then that gets, you know, subdivided into, you know, if you have a, more, a lot of, you know, some park home homes, you want to see the rent level in the area. So that gets divided. So the 15 major parameters is really ever evolving, ever refining process that we are, you know, constantly working on to make sure that you know, we qualify our deals when we buy because you know the saying that um, you make the money when you buy. And I come to find that that's true after 26 deals later, plus other uh, acquisitions that I've had with other real estate. So then that's extremely important. Are you a real estate investor looking to break into the multifamily investing space? Have you heard of MLFIN Con happening in Charlotte, North Carolina, June 23rd through the 25th? The Multifamily Investor Nation Convention is a place to learn from over 60 plus high level apartment investors and also to network with over 700 investors. If that's not enough for you, Shaq, yes, Shaquille O'Neal, Barbara Cochran, and Jocko Willink will be live and in-person speaking at this event. Be sure to secure your tickets to this live in-person event as the tickets are going fast. You can even upgrade your ticket to the VIP to have the opportunity to rub shoulders with these high-level speakers, including myself, after their session. Jocko Willink will also be attending the VIP party on Friday night at the event. 
So go to mfincon.com to find out more details. There's also sponsorship opportunities available too. For details for this event and to purchase tickets, visit mfincon.com. Use promo code LIFEBRIDGE to get $200 off your tickets. That's mfincon.com. Yeah, it's it's interesting you talk about these 15 points are, you know, it sounds like, you know, you're documenting everything you're learning, right? You know, you've created these perimeters where it's like, okay, you know, these are the things after this many acquisitions, we know we need to know these things. We know this, this is how a park operates the best, or, you know, these are the ways that we purchase the best deals. And it's just, I was, I was reading or listening to something recently uh, about acquisitions and this group, you know, it's like they did, they created a platform. It's like AI, similar to what you talked about. You know, it's they created these perimeters where it's like, man, they narrow their focus in a big way, but then they know every deal in their market that fits those perimeters and then they're building the relationships. And so it's very similar, you know, sounds like to what you're talking about. Um, Speak to how you found some of those sellers, how you, you know, how did you look up that information or is there a website? Is there some way that you all bought the information? I know uh, listeners or people often say, well, you know, how do I find the, that information, even connect with that seller in the first place? Right. So I think most of the sellers that we found are through um, the Mobile Home Park Store website and a lot of forums, online forums from Mobile Home Parks. When we started out, you know, we would start to build those relationships. Um, that's kind of how, you know, they had a listing. So we, you know, ran it through our algorithm. We became interested and we reached out. And that's kind of how we got the relationship started. And it really got stronger when we closed the deal with them and sh- uh, demonstrate the ability to close deals. And they pretty much recognized us as a player in the market. So when they have something else coming up, they will definitely give me a shout and, you know, see us that, you know, hey, they, these guys are serious and they're able to actually close deals instead of a lot of, there are a lot of can tie kickers and, you know, um, in, in the market who, who don't really follow through. But that relationship really starts really strong if they had a really good uh, working experience with you and actually was managed to uh, ma- manage to uh, close the deal with you. Yeah. Speak a little more to that first interaction with that seller. How did, how, uh, you know, a little more about how you, you should, you showed those things you just talked about. That's so important, right? That you're not a tire yeah. kicker that you, you can close a deal. Right. So I think it's important to have two motivated parties to work together. A relationship can never work when there's only one person in there trying to work it out, trying to be motivated. And, you know, so don't, pester anyone. Don't pester any seller. So want to make sure that the seller has a listing. You know, usually how it started out was the seller had a listing. So he was motivated in the first place to sell something. So I was not pestering him. I was following through, following up, inquiring about, you know, what, what, what will you have to offer? So that's the first step. And once they respond, you know, just be you know, extremely professional in your dealings with, with the seller and set your expectations. Relationships is all about expectations. So, and, and the expectations, uh, sorry, expectations with the investors as well. So setting expectations straight and deliver. So with the seller, it's the same thing. Don't, don't try to screw the seller. I would say, you know, as a buyer, don't try to try to make it a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, anything else about the acquisition algorithm that maybe I I wouldn't even know to ask you about how you all do something that would be helpful. Right. So the acquisition process is, like I said earlier, it's it's ever evolving. And I think, you know, it would be interesting to discuss, you know, a couple of other parameters that we look at. So for example, the market. So the market is, it doesn't have to be in the center of a major MSA, metropolitan area, but it has to be uh, closer to some economic hubs. It has to be a town. It has to be some dynamics going on in the town to make sure that there are enough customers for that. And another thing is the spread, right? So is the the difference between the interest rate and the cap rate. When the cap rates were high and the interest rate were low, it was it was it was very um, attractive. And right now the interest rates are rising, which means the cap rate tend to be a little bit higher, but that haven't really materialized. We'll see about that. So the, the spread is extremely important because if you don't have a spread, 
you know, have a lot of meat on the bone and you don't, there's no money to be made. Another thing, one of the major parameters is if there are park owned homes, what are the, what's the status of the title? Because that could be another nightmare. So those of you in mobile home parks, you know, park owned home titles can be a nightmare to deal with because if the seller doesn't have clear title, the title company doesn't care, right? They only care about the title of the property, not necessarily the homes. So your our due diligence process acquisition. So due diligence is also a major part of it. So due diligence process to verify that. And obviously, you know, the due diligence, due diligence we have like three phases. The phase one was before we started spending money, tracking permits, verifying income, because the income is not there, the deal is not there. And the second phase is when you start spending money, getting inspection re- reports. And third stage is when you have the final negotiation, final wrapping up. So there are so much there, there's so much that goes into the um, acquisition, but those are just I just listed out some several of the major parameters. Yeah, so those that's parameters incredible. are really as good as gold um, if you use them correctly. Yeah. No, that's that's really good. And I, I just think so much of that could be applied to other aspects of real estate, right? It's not just mobile home parks, but uh, but numerous things you listed there about the acquisition the algorithm or the relationships and finding the people and you know building that relationship is so crucial uh, in the market, all those things. No, grateful for that. Uh, we're going to jump to a few final questions, Charlotte. What's the big challenge you all have had in the last 12 months? The biggest challenge we had was the eviction moratorium. So we started in 2019 and into 2020, so we all know the COVID is called COVID-19. So we really started with COVID and it's still kind of not over. And th- when the uh, eviction moratorium was in place in most of the states, we've been having issues, especially with tenants who um, already w- weren't paying really that well. And all of a sudden, this kind of protection for them. And they know that we have no ammunition to get them to pay. And that was that was difficult. So what we did was that we always try to be advocates for the tenants. So we apply for rental assistance on their behalf or encourage them to apply for rental assistance, including local ministries, you know, charitable organizations to receive rental assistance payments so they can get caught up. So we try to work with the tenants. So that was actually, you know, one of the biggest challenges. So it's uh, eviction moratorium. Good thing is we are finally seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. That you know the, those um, moratoriums are you know have been lifted. And then so you all took a, a really a proactive approach there, and and instead of just coming down on the tenants and you know saying come on get you know and I know you have to stay in right. touch about those things right. They do need to know. They need to pay their rent, of course. However. Right. You all were proactive in the sense of you were you went out looking for assistance and helped them apply for that right. assistance. Right. Yeah. There, there so, have to be some actions because if you just ask someone, you know, who didn't have any int- intention or didn't have the money to pay, there's nothing that you're going to get out of that. So stop, stop, you know, pounding on something that that wouldn't work, that that wouldn't drive any results. Did that change how you all look at properties moving forward or how you look at the tenants that are out of property moving forward? You know, what did that you know, change in how you all operate to, to buy the next deal? Absolutely. So we think tenants at mobile home parks are were really any rental property, real estate as kind of stakeholders, business associates of a company, stakeholders of a you know particular deal because they live there and they own the home that sits on the lot, and it's difficult to remove that. So you want to make sure there are no bad actors, bad players, or very little bad players in a particular park. You want to make sure if your business is full of really bad business associates, bad stakeholders, then your business want to flourish, right? So for us, that really made, made us realize that even more, that tenants, a good tenant is ag- as good as gold. And you want to make sure you kind of vet them a little bit more. Um, you want to make sure you really verify that income. If you see a history during your due diligence that there are so many people not paying, then I will be extra careful with that. So that's something that we definitely would definitely uh, focus on. Do you have any uh, market predictions just for the real estate uh, market over the next six to 12 months? You're all buying, selling. What do you all see coming? I think because the rates are coming up, uh, are going up in, to fight inflation. And I, I think the prices will start to go down slightly. As far as how fast, you know, I think that depends on the market, individual market. But I think in the next one or two years, there could be the mobile home park space could be facing a 
a correction, a market correction. Some markets may be delayed in materializing that correction. You may not see the, you know, it may not see the price uh, reduction in some markets. Uh, but I think as a whole, I'm thinking that it will be some sort of um, slight correction. But so sit tight as investors and survive this and, you know, continue operating your park well or assets well, whatever you're doing. And, you know, the market is always having a cycle, right? So mobile home parks, I think, is in still early on in this cycle. So I still see this asset class going up. It's just that markets always have corrections. And that's, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it. And as far as recessions, you know, people say recessions coming, you know, mobile home parks would be somewhat of a recession, I wouldn't say proof, but recession resistant, resistant um, asset class. So sit tight and relax and uh, survive this. What's your best source for meeting new investors right now? Well, best source, I, I would think, I think the best sources, you know, for any kind of marketing, any kind of getting to new customers would always be a lot of referrals. So we actually had from, we, we only had two investors when we started. Now we have 27. So people who actually invested. So they were all, most of them are from good referrals from the internal network. They've invested in deals with us, multiple deals, and they liked what we were doing and they referred to us and then our website. And our, we're, we're very active on our social media as well. So, yeah. Incredible. It's incredible. You all bought 26 deals and, and have 27 investors. Uh, it's impressive to me. So they are obviously happy. They're probably repeat as well, you know, Absolutely. investors. So Yeah, uh, most that, of them are repeat that, investors. Yeah. Yeah. So that says a lot about, about you all. That's incredible. What are, what are the most important metrics that you track? The most important metrics that I care about are for deal is number one, the internal rate of return, IRR, right? Within a particular, usually where our, our assets have a shorter hold time. So three to five years, usually. So within three to five years, the IRR is extremely important. And the second one is the annualized return after uh, capital gains, after we exit. Okay. That's the second one. The third one is the um, equity multiple after we exit. So how much money have investors? That's for investors, not net income, um, net return only for investors. You know, as far as the promotes for us, we don't count that in. So those are the three most important parameters. Um, sorry, metrics that, that we track for yeah. our deals. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, what about some daily habits or you know things that you are disciplined about that have achieved the highest return for you? Read, read good books. I learn from them, and you know if you can develop a habit as a reader, read a lot, you would learn always and you will always learn new strategies to improve your business and go easy on the letting yourself affected too much by you know other people's success as well. I think that can be challenging, especially if you're starting out and you hear those stories, oh, this person made a million dollars, he made a million dollars. So just be careful with that because you know that a lot of those are, are, are marketing. A lot of those are just, you know, because you don't know what they're going through behind the scenes. So just uh, mm. be careful with that. Believe in yourself. That's very wise right there. Very wise. Yeah. Uh, you, you focus on yourself getting 1% better every day, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Only yeah. compare with yourself. That's right. That's right. What about uh, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? I think it's, it's my experience coming from China. So I was born in China, come from China when I was 16 years old by myself. My parents never came with me. So I pretty much hopped on the plane, went meet my host family who I never met and learned English from scratch. And pretty much just the whole experience really built character. Wow. No doubt about that. Uh, and how do you like to give back? I think to give back, I think I would like to take on the role of a mentor for people who are starting out because people tend to forget once they achieve some sort of success that how they where they came from. And I think to give back, you can, especially for, you know, if you graduated from college and the college is nearby. For for me, I graduated from Georgia, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. And there you can sign up as a mentor for your uh, for for students who are looking to get into real estate, get into the professional world. Charlotte, it's been a pleasure to get to know you and have you on the show. Uh, you've provided a, a ton of value to listeners and myself, just thinking through the Blue Ocean strategy, how you applied that, but also the acquisition algorithm and how you all are finding deals uh, as two topics that that you were able to go into quite in depth on. So I'm grateful for that and the value that you've added to us. Uh, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? 
Right. So the best way to reach me and us would be to go to our website at johnscreekcapital.com. And there is a short contact form. I usually reach out within a couple of hours after you fill it out and uh, we'll, we'll have a conversation and go from there. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today. 